ladies and gentlemen, again let me say welcome to our home and thank you for taking the time to be here. I'm well aware that whether you're here in person or through the medium of motion picture, that for most of you, it's not easy to fit meetings of this kind into your schedules. But the fact that you are here indicates that you do have an interest in the subject. And that means there's a tremendous obligation on my part to develop that subject with the kind of usable information that will make it worth your while. So in order not to waste any of your time, let's dispense with the usual preliminaries and get right down to the business at hand. The title of this presentation is More Deadly Than War, but the subject matter itself is Revolution. We're going to examine in quite a bit of detail the communist theory and practice of revolution, particularly as applied to the United States. Now this will not be something dreamed up out of thin air. This will be the strategy as taught by them and advocated by them in their own manuals, in their textbooks, and in their schools. Now the organization of this material will lead to three rather startling conclusions. The first is that the communist program for revolution in America is divided into two phases, violent and nonviolent. The second conclusion is that the strategy for violent revolution calls for chaos, anarchy, mass confusion and panic among the people, a crisis in government, and then out of the vacuum, the sudden seizure of power by communist-led guerrilla bands. The third conclusion is that the nonviolent phase of revolution actually is more important to the communists and more potentially dangerous to us. Now the strategy for this phase calls for the gradual transition of our government into a communist regime done peacefully and legally but under the banner of socialism. This then is the outline of the material that lies ahead. So let's start right at the beginning with conclusion number one which is that the communist program for revolution in America is divided into two phases, violent and nonviolent. Now a good place to begin is with this communist booklet entitled On the Nature of Revolution, the Marxist Theory of Social Change. It was written by Herbert Aptheker, one of the leading theoreticians of the Communist Party in this country. And on page 11, Aptheker says, The equating of violence with the nature and process of revolution is not correct. Violence may or may not appear in such a process, and its presence or absence is not a determining feature of the definition. Now this comes as quite a surprise to many of us because for years we've been used to thinking of communist revolutions only as those which involve the overthrow of governments by force and violence. Now that entire phrase has been written and spoken so often as a single concept that many of us haven't even considered the possibility that the communists might have another approach to their goal, that they might overthrow the government without force and violence, that they might in fact plan to come to power through means that properly could be called peace and politics. Now in order to go any further, it'll be necessary for us to define a few terms. When the communists speak of the two kinds of revolution, they don't come right out and say so in plain English, of course not. You see, they claim to be practicing something called scientific Marxism. And so they have to dress up these crude concepts in elaborate phraseology. For instance, when the communists speak of violent revolution, they describe it as a war of national liberation. Now the so-called theory behind this is that the people of the country marked for takeover supposedly are an oppressed people. They're dominated by an imperialistic foreign power that has colonized them and exploited them. And so the communists claim that it's their duty, their historic duty, to liberate them from the yoke of fascism or imperialism or colonialism or whatever. Now, naturally, the communist orientation of the movement is played down. They prefer to identify themselves usually as a people's army of liberation or a national liberation front. Of course, this is the kind of guerrilla warfare we've seen used in China, Algeria, Cuba, South Vietnam, and many other places around the world. But there are other phrases also used to describe the same process. Occasionally, they'll refer to this violent type of revolution as an anti-imperialist war or an anti-colonialist war, but they all equal the same thing. 
wars of national liberation, anti-imperialist wars, and anti-colonialist wars are all phrases used to describe that aspect of communist revolution aimed at overthrowing the government by means of force and violence. To describe their nonviolent revolution, the communists most often use the term proletarian revolution, but they also refer to it as the socialist revolution and sometimes as the anti-monopoly struggle. But here again, they all add up to the same thing. The proletarian revolution, the socialist revolution, and the anti-monopoly struggle are all merely different ways in which the communists describe their strategy for overthrowing the government through non-violent means. Well, all right, having defined some of the key phrases, we can return now to the communist literature and be able to understand what they mean when they use these words. Now, in 1960, the representatives from communist parties all over the world gathered in Moscow and issued a joint declaration which included this statement. Our time, whose main content is the transition of capitalism to socialism, is a time of socialist revolutions and national liberation revolutions. In other words, simply stated, we're living in an era of two kinds of revolution, one violent and the other nonviolent. Now, here's a document published by the Communist Party in this country in 1968. It's entitled, The New Program of the Communist Party USA, a Second Draft. And on this subject, here's what it says. Contemporary revolutions bear two distinctive marks. They are socialist, they are anti-imperialist. More than a billion human beings are now embarked on socialist revolution. A larger number is in varying stages of revolution for national liberation. Well, in order to relate this general concept of two kinds of revolution to the specific application here in the United States, it'll be necessary for us to examine rather closely the communist position on what they describe as the Negro question. Now, basically summarized, the communist position on the Negro question is as follows. As early as 1928, the communists declared that the racial differences among our people constituted the weakest and most vulnerable point in our social fabric. By constantly probing and straining at this one spot, they calculated that eventually the cloth could be torn apart and that Americans could be divided, weakened, and perhaps even set against each other in open combat. They said in no unmistakable terms that the Negro people, because of their secondary social status and their predominant working class composition, offered greater revolutionary possibilities than any other cross-section of the population. To develop these possibilities, the communists proclaimed that the American Negro constituted a separate nation within a nation, a colony within the continental borders of the United States. The people of this nation were said to be oppressed and exploited by colonialist, imperialist, racist America. Consequently, the Communist Party called for their liberation, their right to self-determination, to break away from the United States and to set up their own nation within our borders. Now, to bring this about, of course, force and violence must be used. A war of national liberation must be fought. The territory designated for this nation to be liberated was the Black Belt in the South, those counties and states in which the Negro population was dominant. When established, the new nation was to have a Soviet-type government and be totally subservient to the Communist Party. But, and this is extremely important, the Communists made it clear from the very beginning that they could never hope to capture all of the United States with a war of national liberation, only part of it. You see, elsewhere in the world, the segment of the population supposedly liberated by the communists has been a majority segment. The peasants in China, the Muslims in Algeria, all the people in Cuba. But in the United States, our Negro population is in the minority. And even if the communists should be successful in creating similar liberation movements among other segments of our people, as they're trying to do, for instance, among Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, and even American Indians, even if they should succeed and then amalgamate all of these together into one large liberation movement, 
it still adds up to a minority of the total population. And the communists are not stupid. They realize that revolution of force and violence dependent upon a minority is doomed to ultimate failure except in those areas where they actually do constitute a majority. But they aren't going to settle for just part of the United States. They want all of it. And so they made it clear long ago that their violent war of national liberation must be secondary to the nonviolent proletarian revolution. To take the United States, all of the United States, it'll be necessary, they say, to involve white people as well as black, to create a broad coalition, a revolutionary link between the civil rights movement, organized labor, peace groups, student dissidents, and in general, to escalate their revolution in America from race war to class war. Now this, in a nutshell, is the communist position on the Negro question. Let's turn now to the record and see how the communists themselves explain it. Now, this communist booklet entitled American Negro Problems was published in 1928. It was written by John Pepper, alias Joseph Pogani. Now, Pogani was sent to this country as the personal envoy of Joseph Stalin, and his specific mission was to bring the American Communist Party into line with the policies and directives from Moscow, particularly with regard to the Negro question. And here is what Pogani said. The Communist Party of America, in its fight against imperialism, must recognize clearly the tremendous revolutionary possibilities of the liberation movement of the Negro people. It is the basic duty of the Communist Party to develop all revolutionary possibilities of the Negro race. The Black Belt in the South constitutes virtually a colony within the body of the United States of America. Self-determination means the right to establish their own state, to erect their own government if they choose to do so. The Communist Party of America must come out openly and unreservedly for the right of national self-determination for the Negroes. But it would be a major mistake to believe that there can be any other revolution in imperialist America than a proletarian revolution. Now let me repeat that last sentence because it's the key to this entire presentation. It would be a major mistake to believe that there can be any other revolution in imperialist America than a proletarian revolution. Well, moving forward to the year 1935, we come to this communist booklet entitled The Negroes in a Soviet America, written by James Ford and James Allen. Beginning on page 24, the general strategy is laid out in rather graphic form. You see, there's a major heading here entitled The Negro and Revolution. Directly beneath this, there's a subheading entitled Two Revolutions in One. And then within this section, it says, the problem of Negro liberation has two aspects. We shall first consider each separately and then show how the solution for the first flows into the solution for the second. Now, the next subheading then is entitled The Rebellion of an Oppressed Nation. And the section that follows that describes the violent revolution that must be fought to liberate the black belt of the South. And then finally, over in the next page, there's another subheading entitled The Proletarian revolution. And here we begin to get an idea finally of what this phase of the revolution is all about. It says, capitalism is decaying. It is an outworn system. Capitalism is based upon the private ownership of machines, factories, railroads, land, and all other means of production. Only one thing can do away with the basis for the existence of capitalism, the expropriation of the capitalists. And by the way, I'm sure you realize that Everyone here, by communist definition at least, is a capitalist. So you should feel good to know that there are those who are planning your expropriation someday. In order to expropriate the capitalists, the workers first need to discard the existing government machinery and to institute a working class government. Under this new workers' government, the building of socialism begins. Now, exactly what that's all about, the building of socialism, we'll get to in a moment. But finally, on page 28, under the third subheading entitled, The Combination of Two Revolutions, the communists reveal how the two phases of their revolution are related to each other, and which of the two is most important to them. Between the proletarian revolution and the revolution of the Negro people, 
there is a living link. This is the working class. Here reposes the leadership of the two aspects of the revolution. But the Negro communist is first and foremost the exponent of the proletarian revolution. Well, 1935 is a long time ago. And sometimes we hear it said that the communists have since abandoned this concept. But ladies and gentlemen, they cannot abandon it for the simple reason that if they did so, they'd be abandoning the classic dual form of revolution dictated by Marxism-Leninism. They'd cease to be communists. To justify violence, they have to be able to claim that they're liberating people. And if people are to be liberated, then it's necessary to go through the motions, at least, of pretending that they have a right to form a nation of their own. And so the communist position on the Negro question today is no different than it was back in 1928. Now, Political Affairs is the official monthly magazine of the Communist Party in this country. The date on this particular issue is November 1968. The feature article for that month was The Right of Black America to Create a Nation, written by communist theoretician Claude Lightfoot. Now, Lightfoot points out that many years of migration of Negroes into the North and of Caucasians into the South have altered the population statistics to the point where the black belt is considerably smaller today than it was when the communist position on the Negro question was first drafted. Therefore, he says, the concept of a Negro nation must not necessarily be restricted to just one large territory in the South, but must be expanded now to include the so-called ghetto areas in the North. So having updated the basic strategy, to reflect present realities, he then repeats the same old communist line. On page nine, he says, we should call for a plebiscite of all black Americans on whether they want to remain in the general commonwealth or to establish another nation within the continental United States. Thus the slogan of self-determination today means the struggle for the right of black America to form a nation if it elects to do so. Now, in passing, ladies and gentlemen, you may have wondered why the Communist Party has been a staunch supporter of the drive to place a black studies curriculum into our high schools and colleges. Well, the reason becomes obvious the minute you take a look at the textbooks and the study guides. The net effect of these courses on the students who enroll is to create a consciousness of nation. By stressing the historical and cultural differences between our black and white citizens, instead of the similarities, the predictable impact upon the student is such that he'll view the communist call for a separate nation with far more acceptance than his parents did. Under the guise of academic balance, these courses have become a brilliant device for conditioning young people to accept still one more part of the total program for revolution. But returning uh, once again to Claude Lightfoot, after having called for a separate nation, he then repeats the ever important point that as important as the national liberation movement may be, it still must be secondary in importance to the nonviolent, peaceful transition to communism called the socialist revolution. He says, from this it follows that the advocates of a black nation must identify themselves with all that is required to set up a socialist America, recognizing that black people alone could never destroy capitalism. To digress again for just a moment, I'd like to point out that this concept of two kinds of revolution is really the basis for that much publicized split between Moscow and Peking. The Moscow group says there are two kinds of revolution, violent and nonviolent. We believe in using either or both, depending on which combination proves to be the most effective. But as true Marxist-Leninists, we believe that the gradual nonviolent approach is more effective in today's modern world. To which the Peking group shouts in reply, heresy, heresy. True, there are two kinds of revolution, and we too are willing to practice either or both, but we are the true Marxist-Leninists, for we believe that the quick, violent approach is more effective in today's modern world. And there's the total difference between the two factions of world communism. Each claims to be more correct in its interpretation of classical communist strategy. But as far as the United States is concerned, you can be sure that it makes precious little difference. 
Both types of revolution are being used against us today. Both are enhanced by the presence of the other, and both lead to exactly the same destination. All right, let's move along now to the second conclusion. The strategy for violent revolution in America calls for chaos, anarchy, destruction, a crisis in government, mass confusion and panic among the people, and then out of the vacuum, the sudden seizure of power by communist-led guerrilla bands. Now this is the kind of activity, the overthrow of government by force and violence, that most people think of when they speak about communist revolutions. So there's no need to belabor the point. But I'm going to take just a moment to show the extent to which the communists actually are planning to use this kind of revolution against the United States. Now this is not so well known. Now here is a book that I think ought to be in every home library. It's entitled Color, Communism and Common Sense by Manning Johnson. Now as you can see from his photograph, Manning Johnson was a Negro. And he was also a member of the Communist Party. He joined the party as a young man because he honestly believed that the communists were trying to improve the conditions of his people. He was a dedicated communist. And eventually he rose to one of the highest ranks. He was appointed to the National Negro Commission of the Communist Party USA. But after many years, Manning Johnson finally came to the realization that the communists weren't the least bit interested in improving the conditions of the Negro people. He discovered that instead they were merely planning to use his people, and these are his words, to use them as cannon fodder in a bloody revolution to destroy America. And when he woke up to this, he dropped out of the party and devoted the rest of his life trying to alert his fellow citizens of all races to the true nature of the Communist Party as he knew it to be from the inside. And this book contains much of that story. I wish I had the time to examine the entire volume with you page by page, but here at least is one short quotation that pertains to the immediate topic. Manning Johnson said, Black rebellion was what Moscow wanted. Bloody racial conflict would split America. During the confusion, demoralization and panic would set in. Then finally the Reds say, now at this point he quotes verbatim from a communist directive that he studied while inside the party. Workers stop work. Many of them seize arms by attacking arsenals. Street fights become frequent. Under the leadership of the Communist Party, the workers organize revolutionary committees to be in command of the uprising. Armed workers seize the principal government offices, invade the residences of the president and his cabinet members, arrest them, declare the old regime abolished, establish their own power. Now, here is a piece of vicious communist propaganda that perhaps some of you have seen. It's called The Crusader. It's published periodically in Red China and is widely circulated through the Negro communities here in America. It's written by Robert F. Williams, one of the organizers of the Revolutionary Action Movement, better known as RAM. Williams also was the president of the local chapter of the NAACP in Monroe, North Carolina. At that time, needless to say, he wasn't telling very many people that he was also a member of the Communist Party. Now one day back in 1961, he decided to start a small war of national liberation of his own. Apparently he was too impatient to wait for the big signal. So finally to avoid prosecution for assault with a deadly weapon and for kidnapping, he fled to Cuba and then to Red China, where he now writes communist propaganda. One other thing you should know about Robert Williams is that recently he was elected by members of SNCC, CORE, RAM, the NAACP, and similar groups as the president in exile of something called the Republic of New Africa. Following the communist line in every detail, these men claim that they're the representatives of a new government and a new nation within the continental borders of the United States. They issued a demand to the State Department that a large segment of land be turned over to them as their rightful territory. The proclamation said that they're now prepared to negotiate in good faith the peaceful transfer to them of the southern portion of the United States. The implication being, of course, that if they don't get it peacefully, then they'll just have to take it by force and violence. Already, the Republic of New Africa has established a central headquarters in Mississippi, and its leaders in the north 
are actively recruiting a Black Panther guerrilla force and what they call a Revolutionary Freedom Corps, the RFC, from among black militant students to act as organizers and to set up local provisional governments, as they call them, in the so-called ghetto areas. But the reason I've mentioned all this is merely to introduce properly one Robert F. Williams, the president in exile of this Republic of New Africa and the author of The Crusader. Now here is what Robert Williams says. The lifeblood of U.S. capitalism is its productive capacity and its extensive commerce. If these two factors were to become paralyzed and rendered sterile, the orderly function of the government establishment would degenerate into a state of chaos and the superstructure of the system would collapse. The more automated a society is, the more vulnerable it is to forces of calamity. What would highly mechanized America be without electrical power? What would it be without modern transportation? What would it be without its industrial capacity? And then having asked these questions, Robert Williams proceeds to explain in minute detail exactly how to manufacture the devices that can be used by a mere handful of people to ensure that highly automated America will lose its electrical power, its modern transportation, and its industrial capacity. I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that less than a dozen people, if they know what they're doing, can reduce any of our major cities into a helpless, seething mass of confusion, panic, and death. Just one person, one person can poison the city's entire water supply or destroy the main aqueduct or blow up the principal pumping stations. And where would people in Los Angeles, for instance, get a drink of water if it didn't come out of a pipe? And how long can a human being survive without water? Four or five days, perhaps? But long before that, there'd be tens of thousands of people dead in our cities, not from thirst, but because they were unable to defend what water they had from roving bands of desperate people who were dying of thirst. And that's thinking only of the loss of water. In your mind's eye, compound that with no food, no electricity, no way to dispose of sewage, no police protection, no water pressure to fight fires, no radio or TV, no telephone, no buses, no gasoline for your car, no way to escape, no place to go if you could. And don't think for a minute that the countryside would be immune from disaster either. In this issue of the Crusader, the communists call not only for extensive chaos within the cities, but for putting to the torch every village, every forest, every field, and every barn. The plan is for raging fires from one city to the next. The reason? Well, first, there's the value of sheer destruction. Secondly, it would force us to deploy our defenses and rescue units over the widest possible area. The communists point out that as long as our police and National Guard remain concentrated, they're invincible. But if they can be forced to spread out over the entire city and into the countryside as well, then they can be picked off from ambush one by one. And the third value of massive fire to the communists is psychological. The average American, they say, soft and decadent, when he sees billows of black smoke rising from one horizon to the other, when at night the only light he has to see by is the flickering red from flames leaping into the sky, He'll become paralyzed with fear and panic. He'll run away and hide and do nothing to interfere with the guerrilla bands as they strike at the community's power centers. The Crusader explains how to set up sniper units in crowded metropolitan areas, how to manufacture jumbo Molotov cocktails, the gallon jug size, and how to mix the gasoline with certain ingredients to make it burn like napalm how to pour gasoline into utility manholes in the streets to set fire to the main telephone cables, how to put sulfur tips from matches into air conditioning units and blow up large buildings, how to ignite gas mains and oil storage tanks. It explains how radio-controlled model airplanes can be used to fly explosive charges over heavily guarded fences into gasoline storage areas or munition stockpiles. It even calls for infiltration into the National Guard units, revolutionaries posing as non-militants for the purpose of getting free military training and for gaining access to critical military supplies and heavy weapons. And then, finally, Robert Williams says this. 
Any all-out minority revolution must create a state of crisis wherein almost all of the male population would be forced to remain in their homes to protect their property and families. The middle class is very large, but it is not accustomed to deprivation and terror. Because of its affluence, it has waxed soft. It has no stomach for massive fire, blood, and violence. The motive force behind its life drive is its endless pursuit of prestige, conspicuous consumption, and sensual pleasure. A few years of violent, sporadic, and highly destructive uprisings will set the stage for the grand finale. After the stage is properly set through protracted struggle, America could be brought to her knees in 90 days of highly organized, fierce fighting, sabotage, and massive firestorm. Now, ladies and gentlemen, no evaluation would be complete if we failed to note that the communist blueprint calls also for white retaliation and violence in the black communities. It's a very important objective for the Communist Party. So far, they've only been able to involve a small percentage of our Negro people in this war of national liberation. The great majority want no part of it in any form. But the one sure way to change that is to have white vigilante groups striking into the Negro sections supposedly to seek revenge. We mustn't kid ourselves into thinking that the communists have placed their agitators only into the black communities. They're working both sides of the street. They want hatred, violence, and bloodshed between the races, and they don't care how they get it or whom they use, even children if necessary. Part of the plan calls for commando squads of black revolutionaries to drive into the white residential areas and shoot little children playing on the sidewalks for the sole purpose of drawing out of the white communities violent retaliation into the black communities. Now this is extremely important to the communists. They must have it. For in this way, they plan to unite the entire Negro population for protection behind the militant minority. It's not a very pretty picture, but it's one we need to understand so that no matter what happens to us or to our families, God willing, we'll have the strength at least to avoid doing anything that would play further into the hands of the communists. Ladies and gentlemen, the plans and preparations for a communist revolution of force and violence are far advanced. The organization behind these preparations has almost unlimited financial resources and it provides both training and leadership based upon years of experience in many other countries. Our enemies are deadly serious about their task, and it's nothing short of national suicide for us to continue to ignore their plans and their progress. Well, all right, having said this, now I'm going to qualify it somewhat by turning to conclusion number three. As important as the strategy for violent revolution is, and it certainly cannot be overstressed. Nevertheless, the strategy for nonviolent revolution is even more important to the communists and more potentially fatal to us. So let's turn next to that part of the total picture. Ladies and gentlemen, as pointed out previously, the communists can never hope to come to power over the entire United States through a so-called war of national liberation of a minority population. They can capture a large portion of it and they can create an awful lot of chaos and destruction everywhere else. But to take the country as a whole will require an entirely different approach. The violent revolution becomes of primary value to the communists to the extent to which it can be used to condition the masses psychologically to accept the nonviolent revolution, which is offered supposedly as the only alternative. Hoping to avoid further violence and bloodshed, the public is to be pressured into accepting measures that will move the country gradually and legally toward communism, but without calling it that. The strategy of the proletarian revolution calls for the quiet conversion of our government into a communist regime, but under the banner of socialism. Well, what is socialism? All right, let's define it. According to the dictionary, socialism is a political concept 
based upon the principle of government ownership and control of property, the means of production, and the avenues of commerce. But the important thing, as far as this presentation is concerned, is how do the communists define it? And this is where many people are surprised to learn that the communists have an entirely different meaning for the word socialism than the average American has. Did you know that there isn't a single communist country in existence anywhere on earth? That's right, not one. Russia isn't a communist country. Red China isn't. Cuba certainly isn't. These are socialist lands. That's how communist leaders always describe them. You see, according to the teachings of Karl Marx, communism will come to this world only in some future utopian era, when men will have learned to live together in perfect harmony, when they'll no longer be greedy or competitive, when they'll want to share equally with their fellow human beings and have nothing better than anyone else. When this comes to pass, there'll no longer be any need for police or for government of any kind. And then he said, the state will wither away. When that happens, said Marx, it will be communism. In the meantime, comrades, whenever we come to power, we shall call it socialism. So the next time you hear a communist spokesman stand before a college audience or a TV camera and say innocently that all the communists are doing here in America is working for socialism, you must understand what he means by that word. What he's really saying is all the communists are doing is trying to bring to America exactly the same thing they now have in the Soviet Union and Red China. <laughs> now they can call that socialism if they want to, but most Americans, I think, would describe that over there as communism. The uh, new program of the Communist Party on this subject has this to say. The term socialism describes but the first stage of a new society that in its full development is called communism. Socialism is a transitional stage. Well, the important question, though, is why do the communists promote socialism? Is it merely because they honestly believe that it's a necessary transitional stage to some higher, more perfect form of society? I don't think so. I doubt very much if the communist leaders believe their own fairy tale. And I'm sure they're not so naive as to believe that their present super state is ever really going to wither away. But they promote socialism just the same because they know that socialism by definition means control over people. If the government owns and controls all property, all means of production, and all avenues of commerce, then it controls all people. If we're dependent upon the government for our food, our clothing, our shelter, our jobs, our medical care, then we're far more effectively controlled by those who hold political power than if they stood over us with soldiers and weapons. Some years ago, I happened to attend a meeting where several anti-communist refugees from behind the Iron Curtain were called upon to relate their personal experiences. Some of the questions that came from the audience were rather naive, I suppose, because finally, one of the refugees spoke up and he said, you know, you Americans have funny ideas about life under communism. Apparently you think there's a communist soldier standing on every street corner with a rifle and bayonet to keep the people in line. But this isn't so. He said, oh sure, in the beginning there were plenty of soldiers and executions and deportations to slave labor camps, but we don't see much of that anymore. The open violence lasted only for about a year or a year and a half, and then the anti-communist leadership was liquidated. And now, to the casual observers, there's a great deal of apparent calm and freedom. For instance, he said, I lived in the largest city in the country. We had a large park there directly across the street from a beautiful church. He said they left one church open, one in the entire country, primarily for guided tours of visiting Americans who had come to see if religion was being persecuted. He said, theoretically, any time I wanted to, I could have gone into that park, stood on a bench, and spoken out against communism. Then I could have walked across the street into that church and knelt down in prayer, and I wouldn't have been arrested or bothered in any way. But you can be sure I did not do these things. Because if I had, the very next day, the wheels of the bureaucracy would have begun to turn, 
and I would have been informed that my quota of food stamps had been cut, that my allotment for clothing and shoes had been reduced, that my allocation for living quarters had been downgraded, and finally, that my job assignment had been changed from the kind of work for which I'd been trained to menial labor at lower pay. So none of us did any of those things that we were theoretically entitled to do because of the tremendous power that the Communist Party had over our economic existence. And then he said something that I'll never forget. He hesitated for a moment and weighing his words very carefully so as not to hurt our feelings, he said, you know, I came to America expecting to find a nation of free men, but instead, I find exactly the same thing. Everywhere I look, I see men and women who know that communists are making headway in this country. They know that something must be done and that someone must stand up to them. But they themselves do nothing. They remain silent because they're afraid that if they speak out or take a stand publicly, it'll be bad for business. They may lose a client. They may even lose their jobs. Or perhaps they're receiving a regular government check and already are too dependent upon some of the very people and programs they know they should oppose. And then he said, these men voluntarily have gone behind the Iron Curtain. They're already taken over by the communists. The only difference is that for the present at least, they can still get out any time they really want to, and we could not. I think there's a great lesson to be learned from that because it's true, isn't it? There are many men who are physically brave beyond any question when it comes to standing up against a tyranny that threatens with armies. Some of them carry the actual scars of battle to prove it. But when it comes to this new kind of war, they're lost to the fight. When there is no battlefield, when the weapons are not rifles or bombs, but economic pressures, then who is your enemy? How do you fight? Where do you begin? It's precisely for these reasons that any modern dictatorship must have control over the economic sphere of all human activity. This was true of Nazism, it was true of fascism, it's true of communism, and it's also true of socialism. Regardless of what name we give it, Total government control is, by definition, totalitarianism. That's what the word means. Now, Leon Trotsky, as you recall, was one of the original Bolsheviks who led the communist revolution in Russia. In 1937, Trotsky wrote a book entitled The Revolution Betrayed. And in this book, here's what he said. The basis of bureaucratic rule is the poverty of society in objects of consumption. When there is enough goods in a store, the purchasers can come whenever they want to. When there is little goods, the purchasers are compelled to stand in line. When the lines are very long, it's necessary to appoint a policeman to keep order. Such is the starting point of the power of the Soviet bureaucracy. It knows who is to get something and who has to wait. And ladies and gentlemen, there's no better description than that of why the communists work to promote socialism. No matter whose definition you use, under socialism, those who run the government, and the communists are confident that in America they eventually will be the ones who do so, those who run the government will know who is to get something and who has to wait. And that represents control over human beings. What has all this to do with the communist revolution in America? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it has everything to do with it because the building of socialism is the communist revolution in America. It represents the process whereby our country can be moved gradually toward communism without the people even being aware of it. No matter what grievance we may have, real or imagined, no matter what national problems we may face, the communists seize upon these as excuses to build socialism. They have one and only one solution for all problems. More government, more government, and then more and more until it's total government. 
and forgive me for saying it one more time, total government is communism. Again, let's turn to the record. Shortly after the Watts riot in 1965, the Communist Party brought out this pamphlet entitled The Watts Upsurge, a Communist Appraisal, and here is what it said. The challenge of the Watts explosion can be met only by a truly massive program, a vast increase in the investments in the War Against Poverty program. What is called for is not only a total economic opportunity program for wiping out unemployment and for proper job training, but a program for the total reconstruction of the area. Now the People's World, the official West Coast newspaper of the Communist Party, in its August 28, 1965 issue, ran this rather interesting editorial. What is needed now is an effort that begins to approximate the magnitude of the problem. As a minimum, such a program should demand massive emergency action by the federal government. Well then, six months later, after this particular article, the Communist Party came out with this. It's called the new program of the Communist Party, but this was the first draft, published in 1966. And here's what it said. We favor full use of federal powers to achieve these objectives. Now, as I read this, uh, listen carefully to see if it doesn't sound familiar, perhaps like something you've heard from more respectable sources. Government assumption of responsibility for assuring a guaranteed annual wage complete cradle-to-the-grave social insurance coverage, including all medical care, equal educational opportunities for all, with acceptance of the principle of student stipends, a national reconstruction plan to end ghettos and slums, and provide the nation with a modern rapid transit system operated as a public service, and passage of a National Youth Act that will ensure education, vocational training, and employment at decent wages for the younger generation. Does that sound familiar? Well, ladies and gentlemen, if it reminds you somewhat of the Great Society, it's because it is the Great Society, lock, stock, and barrel. Gus Hall, head of the Communist Party, explained it this way. This is the January 24th, 1965 issue of The Worker, and Gus Hall said, the communist attitude toward the great society can be summarized in an old saying that two men sleeping in the same bed can have different dreams. We communists support every measure of the great society concept because we dream of socialism. And when you recall what Gus Hall means when he says socialism, then you realize that the communists support the welfare programs of the Great Society, the New Deal, the New Frontier, or whatever they decide to call it in the future, because they dream of bringing communism to America through these programs. The next question of importance is, how do the communists promote socialism? Certainly it takes far more than a mere declaration of intent, more than writing a few books. How can they bring it off, especially when there are so few of them? How can they manipulate the vast majority into accepting socialism when they really don't want it? Well, here again we find that they have a plan. The strategy is precise and well tested. It's called revolutionary parliamentarianism. Now the general strategy employed is a political pincers movement, and these are the terms the communists use to describe it a pincers movement applying political pressure from above and from below. Now, when they talk about pressure from above, they mean using their people and their influence within the very government marked for takeover to bring forward official recommendations for legislation. These come from the highest possible levels and carry the full prestige of the government itself. The recommendations, of course, are offered supposedly as solutions to national problems but when passed into law, their only real effect is to vastly increase the power of government and to move the country that much closer toward the ultimate goal. The pressure from below then involves using their influence over the various mass membership organizations of the country 
to create the appearance of great popular support for these recommendations. Of course, the members of those organizations must never suspect that they're being used to promote the communist program. Now, the silent majority, the average person with no particular axe to grind, is caught right in the middle. He looks above and sees highly respected spokesmen for government calling for socialist legislation. He looks below and sees mobs of demonstrators shouting for the same thing. He says to himself, has everyone gone crazy or is it me? Now, he's still in the majority, of course, but he doesn't know it. He thinks he's helplessly outnumbered, and he bows to what he thinks is the democratic will of the majority. All that remains, then, is for the duly elected legislators to place their own careers and political expediency above the best interests of the nation, to yield to this political pressure and pass the legislation into law. Then the whole process starts all over again with new recommendations from above, new demands from below, and finally, new capitulation in the halls of Congress. In this way, the nation can move to the left in giant strides until the ultimate goal of communism itself is reached entirely legally through the constitutional process and in the name of the nation. Now, this government pamphlet entitled The New Role of National Legislative Bodies in the Communist Conspiracy is a reprint of two chapters taken from a communist textbook used in Czechoslovakia. It was written by Jan Kozak, the historian and theoretician of the Czechoslovakian Communist Party. This is one of the manuals used to teach communist cadre how the tactic of revolutionary parliamentarianism was used successfully in Czechoslovakia and how it might be applied to other countries as well. So, as I read this, even though Kozak is speaking of how they did it in Czechoslovakia, think in terms of how the same strategy might be used, or perhaps is being used, right here in America. Kozak said, The pressure from above, successfully employed by our workers' class, was the use made of the organs holding powers, the government, parliament, national committees, for bringing about a wide popularization of revolutionary demands and slogans. The fact that such demands and recommendations emanated directly from the highest state organs had a strong influence on their popularization. Whereas pressure from above is the pressure exerted by the organs of the state, pressure from below is the pressure exerted by the popular masses. The United Mass Organizations, which were led and influenced to a large extent by the communists, represented in this way the direct reserves of the party. All the old proven forms of the struggle were employed, calling of protest meetings, passing of resolutions, sending of delegations, organizing mass demonstrations, and also eventually using strikes, including general strikes. The pressure from below made it impossible for the other parties, which had numerical superiority, to isolate the communists and to stop the revolution. Thus, it made up for the numerical weakness of the revolutionary representatives. Progress toward socialism may take under these circumstances a democratic and constitutional course. All the changes which in their entirety represent a revolutionary transformation of the capitalist society into a socialist one will proceed absolutely legally and in the name of the nation. Is it possible, do you suppose, that revolutionary parliamentarianism is being used against America today? Is there any evidence of this kind of pressure from above? Well, ladies and gentlemen, all you have to do to answer that question is read some of the official reports and recommendations that have been pouring out in a steady stream for years from the bureaus, special agencies, and commissions of the federal government. Consider, for example, just those reports issued by the various President's Commissions, the President's Commission on Automation, the President's Commission on Crime, the President's Commission on Civil Rights, to name just a few. Now, this is perhaps the most classic recent example. It's the report of the President's National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, better known as the Kerner Report, released to the public in March of 1968. Have you read this? 
It's incredible. The list of recommendations supposedly to remove the causes of civil disorders in America reads almost identical to the new program of the Communist Party. And that's not much of an exaggeration either. It calls for the vast expansion of all welfare programs and agencies. It suggests absorbing all city, county, and state welfare programs into one gigantic federal welfare program. And why have state socialism when you can have national socialism? It calls for a, a government guaranteed minimum wage. It calls for federal financing and control of every conceivable sphere of human activity. Education, housing, transportation, even insurance policies. It calls for strict gun control laws and even recommends the creation of a national police force. Well, naturally, it doesn't call it that by name. It refers to it as the National Law Enforcement Center. But there's no doubt as to what its ultimate form will be, especially since it's to operate in conjunction with the Defense Department. But the most incredible thing about this report, I think, is not the list of recommendations. That's almost expected from groups of this kind nowadays. The real shocker lies in its findings, the discoveries it made. Here was a body of men, highly respected, with the prestige and financial resources of the federal government at their disposal. Their task was to uncover all of the causes of civil disorders in our land and to do so impartially with favor or malice to no one. Let the chips fall where they may. Now, would you suppose that the Communist Party played some tiny, microscopic role in the riots, the campus disorders, the assaults against police? Well, you're mistaken. Just because the leaders of these revolutionary movements carry the Viet Cong flag, pay homage to Che Guevara, travel frequently to Moscow and Peking, preach against capitalism, promote the building of socialism, follow the communist line without deviation, and move in perfect unison in every major city. That doesn't prove anything. According to the Kerner report, the communists are playing absolutely no role at all in our nation's civil disorders. Look it up in the index. Here is a book with over 600 pages of fine print dealing with all of the causes of civil turmoil and the words communism or communist aren't found even once. Not even to say that they looked into it and found it not to be an important factor, which is the expected cliché today. Apparently, the internal threat of communism is no longer even worth looking into. But what about the other half of the pincers? Is there any evidence of pressure from below? Well, consider the nature of such things as the mass action tactics of the Selma March of 1965, the various peace marches and civil rights marches held in almost every major city in the intervening years, the Poor People's Campaign and Resurrection City. What are these? Do they truly represent an expression of the majority of Americans, or are they merely well-organized pressure groups putting on an impressive show to create the illusion of vast popular support? And what effect does this have on Congress? Every time there's a new show of strength, doesn't Congress buckle under the political pressure and pass into law the recommendations previously made by some commission or agency of the federal government? And hasn't the silent majority been caught between these pincers? And hasn't the country been taking giant strides to the left through our constitutional process and in the name of the nation? The entire process was best described, I think, by Martin Luther King. He wrote an article for Saturday Review, which appeared in the April 3rd, 1965 issue. And here is how he described it. The goal of the demonstrations in Selma, as elsewhere, is to dramatize the existence of injustice and to bring about the presence of justice by means of nonviolence. Long years of experience indicate to us that Negroes can achieve this goal when four things occur. One, nonviolent demonstrators go into the streets to exercise their constitutional rights. Two, racists resist by unleashing violence against them. Three, Americans of conscience, in the name of decency, demand federal intervention and legislation. And four, the administration under mass pressure 
initiates measures of immediate intervention and remedial legislation. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a perfect description of how pressure from below is being used in America today to further the nonviolent proletarian revolution. You know, it always bothers me when I have to agree with the communists. It doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while, I'll read something in the communist press that is 100% correct. It comes out in their favor even without their having to lie about it. And here's an example. In the People's World, the January 29, 1966 issue, the communist said, the problem is that the power structure that runs both of the old political parties seems to have great difficulty in comprehending what is taking place in the Negro freedom movement. They don't know a revolution when they see one. And all I can say to that is amen, they sure don't. They call it everything under the sun except a revolution. And they're the same people, by and large, who still tell you it can't happen here. Ladies and gentlemen, not only can it happen here, not only is it happening here, but it has been happening here for years. The problem is that most of us haven't been able to recognize a revolution in all of its forms when we saw one. Well, all right, so what do we do about it? What are the countermeasures that need to be taken? And where do we begin? We begin by knowing what not to do. Because if we do the wrong things, obviously, that's worse than doing nothing at all. For example, as I'm sure everyone here is well aware, we must not be led into placing the blame for the riots, the civil disorders, on the Negro people of our nation. Even those few who are promoting hatred and violence in the black communities are not themselves the cause. They're merely being used by forces far bigger than they are to promote the violent phase of the revolution in America. Just as many white people are being used, I might add, by those same forces to promote the nonviolent phase. Secondly, and this too almost goes without saying, we mustn't resort to violence either as a means of furthering political or social goals. And we must do everything humanly possible to discourage others from doing so. Third, we must not be fooled into thinking that the causes of our civil turmoil are such things as poverty, poor housing, lack of education, and similar social or economic factors. As a matter of fact, most of today's self-styled revolutionaries, black and white, come from good homes, could earn better than average incomes if they wanted to work, and, in fact, they're products of some of the finest institutions of higher learning. We shouldn't be indifferent to the social and economic conditions of those in need, and we should do all we can within the concepts of economic and political freedom to improve those conditions. But let's not kid ourselves into thinking that these are the causes of our national problems today. Fourth, we must not look to the expansion of government and government programs as the solution. As I hope I've made it clear by now, this is exactly what the communists want us to do because it's the very process whereby they hope to come to power in this country through nonviolent means. These are the things we must not do. What then does that leave on the positive side? Well, first of all, and perhaps most obvious of all, we must support our local police. But that means a lot more than just putting a bumper sticker on the car. It means taking an active interest in civic affairs to ensure that the police aren't saddled with so-called civilian review boards. Nothing can be quite so damaging to police morale and efficiency as converting every arrest into a trial of the policeman instead of the criminal. To support your local police also means making sure they remain independent of control from Washington. And don't forget, whatever the federal government finances today, it shall control tomorrow. Next on the list, we must recapture the American faith in the free enterprise system. Capitalism has become almost a dirty word in some places, mainly because its defenders were busy enjoying the fruits of capitalism while its enemies were busy writing books and giving lectures. Consequently, capitalism has retreated steadily before the onslaught of socialism 
and now is struggling for its very existence. Young and old, we must become students again and study the theories of Madison and Jefferson, Bastiat and von Mises, just as intently as our enemies pursue the pages of Marx and Lenin, Galbraith and Keynes. Not only must we become grounded in theory, but we must become advocates and spokesmen as well. We must know what we stand for as well as what we oppose. Next, and this is probably the most difficult task of all, we must carry this message regarding the dual nature of communist revolution to our friends, our neighbors, our business associates, and everyone who will listen. Now this is hard by and large because people don't want to hear it. It's bad news. It spoils the party. But you know, I think it's about time we began to worry less about spoiling the party and more about preserving the system that makes the parties possible. And that means accepting our personal responsibility to do everything we humanly can do to carry the truth about civil turmoil to every man, woman, and child in America. Now, ladies and gentlemen, none of these proposals will produce results. And nothing else you may suggest will do so either, unless and until we get right down to the heart of the problem, the life force of the revolution itself. We must discover the identity of those individuals, both above and below, who consciously are furthering the communist program for revolution, and then remove them from their positions of trust and leadership. Anything less than that will be totally futile because we'll merely be running around trying to put out one or two fires over here while they're busy setting ten new ones over there. Now, of course, the minute you begin to think along these lines, you'll become the target of a whole barrage of attacks. You'll be called a witch hunter, a McCarthyite, a right-wing extremist, and other delicate phrases that are well designed to intimidate the average person into silence. If that doesn't work, then you'll be called a fascist, or at least a dictator, because supposedly you want to deny basic constitutional freedoms to a small group of Americans just because they happen to hold political views that are different from yours. How many times have you heard that? And you know, at first it sounds almost convincing, but the argument is a trap. And the bait inside that trap is the hidden assertion that the Communist Party is merely a political party. Now, if it were a political party, and that's all, then of course we would have to grant them all the same constitutional rights and immunities as other loyal American citizens. But if the Communist Party is not a political party, if it is, in fact, a supranational organization dedicated to world conquest, if, in addition to political means, it also uses military means, economic means, propaganda means, bribery, blackmail, treason, murder, and any other means that suit its purposes. Then its members are not political by nature, are not loyal to the United States, and have no legal or moral claim to constitutional liberties. There's no such thing as absolute freedom. For every liberty, an equal and opposite restraint is required. For example, in order for us to enjoy freedom of speech, it's necessary to deny others the freedom to come in here and break up this meeting. The logic of liberty is that it must stop short of the liberty to destroy itself. And if we're to preserve the freedoms we cherish in this land, then we mustn't be tricked by clever propagandists into giving the Communist Party the freedom it seeks to destroy freedom for us all. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to close this presentation with two observations that I know you may not want to hear, but they must be made nevertheless. The first is that this struggle in which we're now engaged, in a very real sense, is more deadly than war. Call it what you will, Cold War, revolution, struggle, whatever. The present stakes are higher than in any other war we've ever known. After all, why do we dread war? Well, there are three reasons. 
death, destruction, and human suffering. But ladies and gentlemen, if communism should ever come to America, we'll face more death, destruction, and human suffering than any people in history has ever faced at the hands of their invading conquerors. And it would make no difference whether the road to communism were traveled violently or non-violently. The so-called expropriation of the capitalists that would lie at the end of that road would constitute one of the greatest bloodbaths of history. Now the second observation is related to the first. It is simply that we have now passed the point of painless solutions and parlor patriotism. There was a time, and not too long ago I think, when we could have pulled ourselves out of this without too great a sacrifice on the part of anyone. All that would have been necessary would have been for us to take an interest in the domestic affairs of our nation and to insist that our elected representatives merely enforce the laws that were then on the books to protect us from internal subversion and to keep the enemy outside the gates. But we didn't. Instead, we slept. And one by one, those laws were stricken down by the Supreme Court. Congress failed to repair the damage and our defenses are no more. Now the enemy is inside our gates. He is on our streets. He is in our halls of parliament. And now there is hell to pay. Our enemy is not going to leave quietly just because we suddenly discover him and ask him to go. Hardly. The nature of tyranny is such that like the barb on an arrow, it goes in easily but the price of pulling it out is a piece of flesh. Now let me be more specific. Before we finally win this battle, and I should hasten to say that there's no doubt in my mind that we're going to win. I'm increasingly convinced of this. But before we finally do see victory, it's now inevitable that some of us, even in this room, will lose our lives in the communist revolution that already is raging around us. I can't tell you who it's going to be, of course. But I can tell you that it'll make no practical difference whether we're resisting at the time or whether we're merely trying to hide. Most of the casualties will occur because people just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now I mention this not to suggest that we all grab our guns and groceries and head to the hills. In many ways, this too would be playing right into the hands of the communists. No, I mention it for only one reason, and that is to stress the seriousness of the challenge that now confronts this nation. It's literally a question of life and death for all of us. And it's about time the American people began to face up to that fact and to act accordingly. I have no idea of what each of you is going to do in the critical days that lie ahead. It may be much, it may be little, it may be nothing at all, I don't know. Only you can answer that question. But ladies and gentlemen, whatever it is you decide to do for your country, do it soon. Do it now. Every minute that you delay further will add dearly to the price of ultimate victory. Thank you.